All right. Awesome. <laughs> Hello, awesome. everyone. Welcome to our session on bringing your whole self to your science, how to do it and what it offers your communication and career, uh, facilitated by Kika Tuff from Impact Media Lab. Thank you all so much for joining us. We're excited to have students and early career researchers joining the ATM from across Turtle Island on what is currently known as North America, also from Australia, Nigeria, China, and Scotland. For those who don't know me, I'm Alexa Goodman, Meopar's training program manager. I use she, they pronouns, and all will be hosting today's session from Kipji Booktuk in Mi'kma'ki, modernly known as Halifax, Nova Scotia. All right, without further ado, it's my pleasure to introduce Kika Tuff. Kika uses she, her pronouns, is a scientist, entrepreneur, and visual communicator deeply rooted in the ecological community. Since founding Impact Media Lab in 2016, Kika has led storytelling campaigns for individual scientists, research organizations, and large scientific institutions. She's created websites, films, museum exhibits, and more to help science reach a wider audience and build community through their work. We'll add a link in the chat box for more information, which you can find on her website. Uh, a personal antidote, when I first met Kika back in September, I was completely captivated uh, by her philosophy on science communication and her approach to leveraging who we are in our science and our work more broadly. I wish I would have met Kika years ago while I was still in school. I remember the first panel discussion that I sat on during my master's degree when the moderator read my bio out loud, I wanted to hide underneath the table. It was pretty cringeworthy, I'll spare the details, uh, but it sounded like a bad dating profile. So I'm wondering, have you ever had a cringeworthy moment like this before? I'm going to launch a poll here because we'd love to hear from you. So to break the ice, we're wondering, have you had uh, experienced a cringeworthy bio moment before? I'll leave this open for uh, another few seconds or so until I see that our participants have answered. I see most folks have read a few or have come across some. Some folks can relate to me, still recovering from the last time someone read yours out loud. So uh, if you thought that was embarrassing, you should have seen how red my face was after I recently showed Kika my bio. And we laughed about it because even after the panel incident, my bio could still be better. And that's okay, embarrassment's an opportunity for growth after all. So we want to know how confident do you feel about your bio? I've launched another poll. Well, I'm glad to see that most folks think that their bio is okay. Some folks are asking for help. Well, today is your lucky day. Geek is going to help us revamp our bios and then some. So without further ado, I'll pass it over to Kika. So uh, as Alexa said, my name is Kika. And I am super excited to be here today to talk to you about how we can bring more of yourself into your work. We're going to take a few simple, easy steps to get started. Um, and I hope even in those steps, I can show you a little bit about what this can do for your communication and your career. So I want to start this presentation with a reminder that I really, I don't feel like we get this often enough. Um, you know, everyone that's here is smart and capable and super passionate about the work that they're doing. You have all worked so hard to be here and I feel like, you know, we need to celebrate that. So I know sometimes in science, you know, there is so much critique so much rejection um, and imposter syndrome is rampant. And I think it can, can be hard to remember that you have so much about that's worth celebrating. Um, and when we can bring that into our science identity, uh, we can do a few, we can achieve a few things. So let's see, today we'll take some first steps and in the process, again, I hope to show you that bringing your whole self to your work can immediately impact the outcome. So here's a rough layout of what we're gonna be talking about in the presentation. First, we're gonna unpack this concept of the whole self. Um, we'll talk about what that means. Uh, we're also gonna talk a lot today about the power of why. Um, and bringing your why into your communication. We're gonna do a really fun activity where we rewrite your professional bio. Um, and as we have alluded, there's gonna be a contest with a prize. 
Um, and then after that, we're going to talk about how do we extend these ideas beyond your bio to things like your website or designing a logo or kind of communication strategy broadly. So the bio is just going to be a tool that we use to explore these ideas, but they can, they can and should expand into all forms of your communication. So let's first unpack this concept of the whole self. So when I say whole self, what I really mean is who you are inside and outside of science. So we're talking about your professional identity as a scientist, but also your identity as a person. Um, so a professional identity that includes layers of who you are and what you stand for. So this is not a comprehensive list your whole self includes, but is no way limited to your education and professional training, um, your background and where you're from in the world, hobbies and interests outside of science. Importantly, your whole self includes your choices and values. So your decision to have or not have a family or your decision to take care of your parents during COVID or, your decisions to prioritize mental health or representation in science or inclusivity. Those values that you carry are so important um, as well as all the things you've overcome to be here. It's a little bigger. Um, so you might be wondering, who, who am I? What am I doing here talking about your whole self? So I consider myself a scientist and a storyteller. I finished my PhD in ecology in 2016 and started Impact Media Lab. And <laughs> at Impact, I am a brand strategist and a science communicator, and I produce science media like documentary films and websites and museum exhibits as we talked about. Um, but the bread and butter of the work that we do here at Impact Media Lab is working with individual scientists to help elevate their identity and elevate their voice in science. So we help them harness the power of their whole self and bring that into their work and communication. And I do not work alone. I have this awesome creative team. Um, this is Alice Sun. She's our brand and web designer. This is Bailey. She's our illustrator and designer. And now we have Amelia. She's the newest addition to our team and helps me manage projects and creative work and does animation. So everything I'm presenting today is really our collective experience in the branding space for science. Um, so I have run all of these ideas by them and, and want to acknowledge their important contributions to everything that I'm talking about today. So is there space for self in science? So why are we here talking about bringing ourselves into our work? Shouldn't science only be about, you know, data, facts, information? Uh, shouldn't it be devoid of any feelings or emotions or elements of the human experience? Somehow I feel like this narrative has trickled into our brains as scientists that to do good objective work, we have to be like blank objective people. Um, but the reality is no, you can, you're not a robot. You can be human um, in science. You can, you don't have to be an objective person to do great objective work. Um, and actually when you start to bring your whole self into this space, you will achieve several things. Uh, number one, you're going to start to attract students and collaborators that are a great fit for you. So not just a good fit, like your research interests overlap or you work in the same place, um, but a great fit, like you have shared values and you have shared goals for your work and life experiences. So when you bring your whole self into your work, you actually build richer, more productive relationships with the people that you work with. That's the first thing. Um, and second, when you bring yourself into your work, you start to more fully own your journey as a scientist. So when opportunities arise, you can ask yourself, is this a good fit for me? Does this align with my values? Does this nurture the things that are unique and special about me? Um, and if the answer is yes, then we can embrace those things. And if the answer is no, then you let them go for someone else where they may be a great fit. 
So as we build a stronger identity for ourselves, we it just helps us um, align with the right people and say yes to the right opportunities. And this is true in science, but this is true in life that it's incredibly valuable to, to do work that's inspired by your humanity um, and all the things that make you you. So it enriches your science and enriches the community that we all work in in this space. Um, much of the process of tapping into yourself, your whole self, and connecting with your identity really starts with this question of why. Why are you here? Why are you doing this work? Why do you come to the office every day? Or why do you come to Zoom every day? Um, so in 2009, Simon Sinek turned the marketing industry on its head with this really simple idea to start with why. He argued that people don't truly buy into a product or a movement or an idea until they understand the why behind it. So he goes on to talk about people like Martin Luther King, Steve, Steve Jobs, and the Wright brothers were all incredibly inspiring because they kept the why at the core of the conversation. So he created this diagram called the golden circle that says we have to start with why. It's the heart of everything that we do and, and all of the way we frame our conversation and then work outwards to the, to the kind of more practical information of how we do things and what we do. And he reiterated this idea, which we're gonna talk a lot about today, that people don't buy what you do, they buy why you do it. And here in science, our business is the business of ideas, right? We pitch ideas to funders, we pitch ideas to students, we pitch ideas to collaborators. Um, those people, funders, students, collaborators, they behave like any consumer. They don't buy what you do, they buy why you do it. So I wanted to start this talk with my why. Um, at the beginning, I said the reason that I do this work is to help scientists have kind of richer, more productive experiences and richer, more productive careers. But um, that isn't my only motivation. I consider myself a bit of a recovering academic. Um, and I notice a lot of things about science during my time in the space. Uh, number one, I noticed that everyone was super smart and super capable and super passionate about the work. Um, but number two, I also noticed that no one thought they were smart enough and no one thought they were capable enough and, and no one realized that everyone else was struggling. And sometimes I think that our imposter syndrome can be so strong that we start to hide who we are um, and instead focus on facts like what we do and how we do it. But again, when we bring ourselves into our science, we make space for our humanity. And that just makes science a more compelling, more welcoming place to be for everybody. So when we hide who we are as people, we perpetuate this status quo that to be a successful scientist, you have to be perfect. You have to be a genius. You have to be free of flaws and family and struggle. And when we hide who we are, we really reinforce the gates that have kept other people out of science for so long. But when we start to share who we are and, and build this kind of richer, more human community, um, not only does it attract the people that you want around you, but it brings dimension and intrigue and vulnerability to science. And that just makes it a better space to be for everyone. So the reason I do this work is because we really believe that um, you know, through identity and why driven science, we, we kind of build this bigger, bolder space. So for a case study today, we're going to talk about your professional bio. Um, and there is a pretty good chance that your bio looks something like this. Um, I am a job title at a university where I apply methods you've probably never heard of to questions you've never even considered. Want to work together? Um, and what you see in a bio like this in bios in science is often we start with the what. I am, insert job title, at insert university. 
where I insert your how, apply quantitative methods, apply qualitative thinking, apply interdisciplinary approaches to questions X, Y, and Z want to work together. So what I see in a lot of science bios is just what and then how. And sometimes they're like this really long sequence of what and how. I went to my undergrad at this university where I did this, and then I went to this university where I did that, and then I went to another university where I did this other thing. And it's just what, how, what, how. But I'm going to encourage you to remember people don't buy what you do, they buy why you do it. So we love to think that people are rational, data-driven creatures, um, that the what and the how are enough because you know they're going to take that information and make a rational decision. Um, but we know from things like neuroscience and psychology that humans are not rational creatures with emotions. They are emotional creatures with the ability to rationalize. So humans are driven much more by emotions and feelings like trust and connection. So people are just not inspired by what you do, but only by why you do it. So when we share our why, you start to tap into the parts of the brain that control decision-making, which is good for funders um, or reviewers or people trying to connect with your work. So we're gonna do a little activity to flip the script. So instead of starting with what you are, what you do and how you do it, uh, we're gonna try instead to open on why you do it. And then we're gonna move into how you do it. And then we're gonna introduce something about who you are. So not just what you are, you are more than an assistant professor at a university or a postdoctoral scholar in a department. Let tell us something about your whole self. So this is a fictional bio that I compiled using parts of the bios of the participants in the workshop. So you may see little parts of your science in here, um, but I tried to organize them in a way that would feel true to the template of what I am, what I do, and how I do it. Um, and then we're going to rewrite this to follow the new template. Um, and Disclaimer, this is for a fictional person, so I may not have compiled this in a way that makes scientific sense, um, but here goes. So I am a senior research fellow at the University of British Columbia. I study snail shells in marine ecosystems with a focus on regions in and around oxygen minimum zones. My work combines observational data and modeling approaches, want to work together. And I hope this will feel a little bit different. I am working to protect snails in oxygen minimum zones because of their critical role as engineers in marine ecosystems. My work combines observational data and modeling approaches. I am an explorer, a dad to two cats, and a senior research fellow at the University of British Columbia. Want to work together? So I introduced a few ideas um, this is kind of one of my uh, one of my pet peeves in science communication is so often we start with like I study snails, I study X, I study Y. And the thing is we have left out our goals for impact in that statement, right? What is the outcome you're hoping to achieve? Are you working to protect snails? Are you working to, understand snails? Are you working to like, like, can we layer in information about what you're hoping to accomplish? So in this case, I said protect snails. And then adding in this statement of because. So because is our visual cue for why something matters. And I feel like in science, we almost never say because. It's always like, I studied this, end of sentence. I work here, end of sentence. I approach these questions in this way, end of sentence. And I feel like we're always missing that, like, because why? So uh, again, this may make no sense at all, but you know, just introduce some notion of why this work that you're doing is so important. 
Um, and, and in doing so, like you've created something compelling, something I'm going to connect with, something that's going to get me stirred up about why you're doing it. It presents vision and drive. It says a lot about who you are and what you value. You're trying to protect these things because of their role in an ecosystem. And that tells me a lot about, about what matters to you. So then I also added in a few other things. I'm an explorer. I'm a dad to two cats. Uh, insert anything about you that, that, that I could connect with on a human level. Like, oh, I have two cats. That's awesome. We could totally be friends. We both study snails and we have cats. Like now we're really hitting it off. So these pieces of information are how people really like trust you. I, I, that sounds weird. Like, do I trust you because you also have cats? People are weird. That's how they work. So it's, it's helpful to actually share more than just your science interests. So our workshop organizer, Alexa, has graciously agreed to let me tackle her bio publicly. Um, and I do want to emphasize, I am not here to shame anyone uh, for the bios that you have currently. Um, I know that we never get trained in this kind of like branding marketing work in grad school. So I'm just here to show you how maybe you can make your bio more compelling by bringing in the why. So we're gonna read this. Alexa is a marine manager with a background in marine biology and sustainability where their research and expertise has focused on managing abandoned, lost and discarded fishing gear, also called ghost gear. They've been a Sustainable Oceans Alliance youth leader since 2019 and are passionate about doing good for our people, for our planet and its people. Alexa joined the Neopar team in May 2021 as training program manager in hopes of equipping the next generation of marine researchers with the knowledge and tools needed to excel in their careers. So for me, a few things really struck me in her bio. Um, I've never really thought about managing abandoned, lost, and discarded fishing gear. The fact that it's called ghost gear is compelling. Um, so that struck me as something cool and interesting about her work, um, but also that she's passionate about doing good for our planet and its people. That's a major why, um, but it's down there kind of in the middle towards the bottom and then the last sentence her why behind the job she has now where she hopes to equip the next generation of marine researchers with the knowledge and tools needed to excel in their careers it's like that is super compelling super inspiring um, so great job for including your why we're just going to take it from the bottom and put it in the top so um here is the rewrite that I um, did for Alexa, where we bring, I'll just read it. Alexa is a marine manager, passionate about doing good for our planet and its people. We have to put that out there first and foremost. They joined the Meopar team in May 2021 to equip the next generation of marine researchers with the knowledge and tools needed to excel in their careers. So not only are we bringing that why up, but we're scratching out the language of like with the hopes of maybe someday achieving a thing like, nope, we're going to say it. You're here to equip the next generation, not with the hopes of equipping, but to do it. Um, and then we're going to introduce this. Is, this is fictional, but Alexa is a scientist, a connoisseur of fine coffees and an advocate for managing abandoned, lost and discarded fishing gear in our oceans. Um, and then that's where we can start to bring in a little bit more of the logistical information, like they have been a Sustainable Oceans Alliance youth leader since 2019, and then that you can kind of layer facts in beyond that. So I don't know, Alexa, are you a connoisseur of fine coffees? Perfect. Um, so I'll just continue to put this slide up. Remember, people don't buy what you do they buy why you do it. So in bringing those things right to the forefront, um, you've hooked them right away. And, and knowing that Alexa's intentions are good makes me want to engage with her work even more. And knowing that we share a passion for the planet and its people is something like, now I really want to work with Alexa because, yeah, okay, we're both scientists and we both 
did professional training and research, but like why I'm really connected to her is so we can drink coffee together and talk about how to do good for the planet. So now it's activity time. We are going to have you rewrite your professional bio. Um, so when I did this presentation to my team, they were like, we need 10 minutes. So we're going to start with five and check in and see how people are feeling. Um, so you have the bio that you wrote for this workshop, for this um, event. Um, we're going to rewrite those. And again, we're going to do a contest. So at the end of this time, we are going to pick three people to share their first bio and then share your new bio. Um, and we will be giving a prize for most improved. Uh, and again, I would like to emphasize, we are not here to shame anyone about the bio that you have. Uh, we're just here to explore ways that we can all do more compelling communication um, and bring more of ourselves into uh, the communication process. So for this activity, I have three rules. Number one, we have, you have to open on your why. So I pulled the two examples, you know, the first fictional one, I am working to protect snails and oxygen minimum zones because of X, Y, Z, or Alexa's where she is a marine manager passionate about doing good for our planet and its people. So you have to tell us why you're here as the first uh, step. And number two, you have to, oh, I guess I only have two rules. Um, and number two, you have to include something about your whole self. So again, in the fictional bio, we rolled in that they're an explorer and a dad of two cats, um, or that Alexa is not only a scientist, but she's a connoisseur of fine coffees. Um, so in case you need prompts for this, I have two questions you should ask yourself, not only for the process of writing your bio, but these are important questions to ask yourself in life. And um, sometimes I know in our careers, we get super busy and it's hard to actually find the time to sit down and ask yourself, okay, that's it. At the end of this career, what do I, how do I want to have changed the world? Um, this, is, this is the kind of question you're, the answer so, should sort of live in your heart and feel present always when you're talking about your work and why you do it. Um, and number two, what are the parts of your life outside of work that have defined your lived experience? And for me, I am a parent of two girls um, and that like becoming a parent and, um, you know, every day I fight the battles of how to raise empowered women. And there is this major part of my life that defines my everyday lived experience and I feel like, yes, we can always connect about science and science communication, but if we can connect too about some of these things that I live every day, um, then, we, then we will be like, not just professional connections, we'll become like real human friends. Um, and I feel like, you know, sometimes you can't understand who someone is without understanding something about their lived experience. So make that easy for people, put it in your bio. I will um, start the clock for five minutes. Um, everyone grab a piece of paper and we're gonna rewrite your bio using two rules. Number one, you have to open on why and then number two, include something about your whole self. Okay. Find yourself struggling. They do have these um, automatic Twitter bio generators. And it can be a fun way to explore playful language because the Twitter bio generator, um, if you've read a lot of Twitter bios, you know, it's like coffee ninja, uh, nap enthusiast, um, cat expert. <laughs> they kind of, it's like insert noun in, you know, so you can go and like plug in a few things and it will generate like kind of more playful versions for you. So I have spent many a time on the generator being like, how else could I talk about this thing? Oh, I guess I could be a coffee ninja or I guess I could be a science communication enthusiast. 
or whatever. So if you find yourself getting stuck offline when you're thinking about your bio, those generators can be a really fun tool for um, play. Hi, Kika. I, it's Diz here. I don't know um, if, if you were looking for some willing people to jump in, but I just put my old bio and my attempted reworking of a new bio in the chat. Ooh, let's do it. Well, I'm so, happy to be ripped apart. <laughs> oh, no ripping apart ever. Um, but yes, I would love that. Um, if we're feeling ready, we could start to, yeah, get some volunteers. So the one thing about when we share it, I think it's kind of fun to read them and then end with want to work together because it just sort of emphasizes the message of like, okay, you heard this bio. Were you compelled to like, yes, totally, we connected. Or like, oh, okay, like nothing for me here. And then see the impact of the two side by side. So Diz, if you are um, willing and interested, it's best if you can read them and you have to end with want to work together. Great. And I'll, and the want to work together would end on the new, the new bio, correct? So I can read my old one as it was before. And then the new one, you can read your old one, but still end with want to work together. Okay. Then read your new one and end with want to work together. And hopefully we can all feel like, oh yeah, totally. I connected. <laughs> or I totally want to work there. together. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I'll say this at the end again, but you know, I, you can always send me your bios at any time for just help and feedback. I'll put my uh, email and stuff at the end. Thanks Kika. Okay. So the old one, and it's a long mouthful. Um, Diz's work as an interdisciplinary educator, social science researcher, and project leader specializes in engaging youth, teachers, organizations, communities, and the Canadian public in ocean, climate, and sustainability, learning, and collective action. Through 20 years of experience as an educator, researcher, adjunct professor, and consultant, Diz has led a number of community, regional, and national projects. In 2017, Diz served as the education lead for Canada C3, uh, epic 150 day journey by ship from Toronto to Victoria via the Northwest Passage. Since 2018, Diz has served as the national lead of the Canadian Ocean Literacy Coalition, leading the Understanding Ocean Literacy in Canada study and co authoring Land, Water, Ocean Us, a Canadian Ocean Literacy strategy. Diz lives in Chelsea, Quebec with her two kids and partner. Want to work together? Oh, I would say that was a that's a great bio to start. There it's, is so much compelling information in there. But way too much. So this has been a good exercise. I've always known I just haven't taken time. So it's I'm very keen for input on how to make it shorter and effective. So here's the attempt at a shorter bio. I work to empower and engage youth educators, organizations and communities in ocean climate and sustainability learning and transformative action. I'm an award-winning educator and researcher, a mother of two amazing kids and a lover of exercising and being in nature. I have co-led educational expeditions to the Arctic and Antarctica, taught, a multi taught at multiple universities and serve as Ocean Literacy Coalition. Want to work together. Oh my gosh, you totally pulled at my heartstrings. I totally want to work together. <laughs> All right. <laughs> uh, yeah, that was beautiful. What a great example to kick it off. What do people feel? Any uh, any feedback for Diz? Other than that was amazing. Yeah, emojis. Let's send some emojis up for that one. Okay, who will be our next volunteer? And the prize is for most improved. Any second takers? I'm happy to, to unmute mute yourself because I can't see my chat. <laughs> Sorry. I'm happy to throw myself into the ring. <laughs> okay. Thank uh, you. So my original bio 
is uh, Megan is a science communicator with a background in zoology and animal behavior. She is passionate about ocean conservation and engaging the public through visual communication. Megan is currently the communications lead and action coordinator with the Canadian Ocean Literacy Coalition. Want to work together? Yeah. Um, and then my new one is a lot more out there. <laughs> Um, Megan is a communicator passionate about bringing science and environmental issues to the masses. She joined the Canadian Ocean Literacy Coalition team in 2021 to advance ocean and climate literacy across the nation. She's a queer scientist, dog charmer, and a visual and musical artist. With her background in zoology and animal behavior, Megan combines her love of art and science to show people why they should care about our people and our planet. Want to work together? Oh my gosh, I love love it am i the only one who's like getting all the feels from these bios that are amazing oh my gosh okay one more or we could do this all day honestly one more person I see some folks have shared in the chat. Oh. Um, are folks comfortable if, if you don't want to read yours out loud, one of us could read them? I'm going to try and find the chat. Sure. Okay. Lisa. So, Lisa's old bio. Lisa is a marine biologist, conservationist, dive master, educator, and blue entrepreneur who graduated from McGill University with a BSc, majored in biology, minored in neuroscience, and an independent researcher, independent project, research project on ecological speciation of Trinadian guppies. She worked in Costa Rica for rainforest monitoring and researching monitoring and research, Florida for marine animal researchers and husbandry, Thailand for coral conservation and research, British Columbia for aquarium and environmental education, and Vietnam for fisheries and tourism. Lisa is currently a Master of Marine Management candidate at Dalhousie University, focusing on ocean literacy for her project. Want to work with me? Lisa's new bio. Having worked as a marine biologist and educator around the world, Lisa is extremely passionate about the about ocean conservation and education. She is an avid reader, world traveler, and photographer who enjoys a warm cup of tea. Lisa is currently a Master of Marine Management candidate at Dalhousie University with a research project focusing on creating ocean, an ocean literacy framework to guide future ocean education initiatives and to create an ocean literate community. Want to work together? Oh my gosh, I love it. Um, well, I feel like Alexa, we're going to totally plot twist this. Everybody who shared wins. That was incredible. We'll work that out <laughs> after the workshop. <laughs> um, did you tell us what the prizes are? What the prizes for? We'll, do, we'll give it to everybody. Free paid Visa MasterCard for $25. Yay. Thank you <laughs> so much for sharing, um, those were amazing. That would be impossible to choose. Um, so th thank you. Thanks so much for um, being vulnerable in a space like this. So um, congratulations, everybody. Okay, so I did want to extend these ideas. Um, how are we doing on time? Alexa, are we, or Katya, are we doing pretty good? We have about half an hour. Oh, okay, plenty of time. Okay, cool. So I want to extend this idea to another activity, um, and that is logos. So I know probably lots of people don't have logos currently. I know a lot of scientists don't. So we're going to browse some lab logos, and then we're going to talk about, you know, maybe designing your logo as, as the next step in kind of formalizing this identity for yourself. So we're going to talk about some logos and then we're going to talk about colors and how you can use color to reflect traits about yourself. Um, and then I'll show you how, a few examples of how kind of color and logos and language all comes together into a website um, that feels really authentic to you. 
So even if you don't have a logo or website yet, we're going to use these as a tool to identify some communication pitfalls. So um, some of these are, might be a little bit blurry. It was hard to find good high res logos on the internet. Um, but here at Impact Media Lab, we do a lot of logo design as part of the identity building process. Like I said, a lot of scientists don't have logos, um, but we kind of encourage them to do it as an exercise to really hone in on, again, your why and what, what is important to you to say when you can't say a whole lot. But I feel like logos are kind of this other example where we put all of the wrong kind of information forward. Much like the bio, when we look at science websites, we often see a lot of what and where and how, um, but not a lot of why. So these are just a few examples. And in the first one, you know, we see like kind of molecules, maybe soil microbes, we see some DNA, we see a very specific landscape. We can guess this is some sort of soil microbial evolution lab in maybe Stanford, it kind of looks like. Um, this is actually a client of ours that we just did a big brand overhaul. He's a physicist, an engineer, a biologist, and you can see the brand confusion coming in. He studies feathers and bugs and hearing aids and a beaker and I don't even know what that is and some worm blobs and this crazy device and trapdoor spiders. And so the problem is when you when you focus on the what it gets really confusing like oh I well I study you know 10 different species and I, I guess if I have to get them all in. I'm just going to make a logo that looks like this. And this is true of um, this fish ecology lab. It's like, okay, clearly we study mangroves and fish and lots of fish and maybe coral and, um, you know, a really heavy emphasis on what and how kind of makes for these really um, challenging to interpret designs, busy. Um, and these are really abundant in science. Um, you know, again, we just sort of pack in everything we do and how we do it. Like, okay, we need math equations because it's a quantitative lab. Okay, we study, you know, these four things and we use DNA. So we got to put DNA in there. Um, this, we study all kinds of stuff. We got to get it all in there. Um, but internally, we talk a lot about like this logo. So the thing that I think is important to notice is that this logo does not feature a laptop. It does not feature a smartphone or earbuds or a watch. Um, it does not include the state of California where the company was founded or anything specific to the what or how the products are created. Um, because as Apple knows and science exemplifies, the product is always changing. Our questions are always changing. Our methods are always changing. And so we never want to anchor the identity in the what. We have to sort of focus on this big picture. Um, instead, the logo shares an idea and really tries to emphasize the why behind the product. So while this logo isn't specifically biblical, you know, it's designed to be a symbol of our desire for knowledge and innovation. Um, this is just a quote from the formal, former Apple executive that, yeah, this is supposed to symbolize lust and a quest for knowledge. So when you anchor, when you anchor your communication in the what and how, things get really busy, like the logo on the left, um, because we're in the business of ideas. Our projects are necessarily always growing, always changing. So your communication strategy needs to be bigger than your what and instead focus on your why, um, because that's what gives you the kind of clarity that offers like a compelling uh, connection. I don't know, when, you, when it's clear, when your message is clear, um, then it makes it really easy to interpret as a viewer. So this is our logo. And I know I said, we can't actually do our own branding work. It's just kind of, it's like the fish in the fishbowl that doesn't see the water. It's really hard to, um, do that kind of big conceptual work. So we worked with a designer named Corinne Alexander, 
Um, and we went back and forth about like, okay, what do we put in the logo? We are, a, you know, in many ways, a science media company. Should we put like a beaker inside of a camera lens so that people know exactly what they're going to get for a product? Um, and she helped us think about like, okay, like a lot of times the name is, you know, your name also does a lot of work for your logo. So if, for instance, you're calling it a media lab, you don't have to show the media as well. Same if you're a quantitative ecology lab, you don't actually have to put math equations in your logo. Like we get it, we can read, we know what that means. So as you're designing a logo, think about like how the name of your lab or the name of your group um, is gonna carry some of that work. And again, focus on the why. So um, because I am from ecology, you know, I am also very inspired by conservation and nature and the um, protection of natural systems. So for this logo, she helped us tap into like, um, you know, the owl as a symbol for wisdom and guidance, because this company tries to be like a guide for scientists in this kind of weird marketing space. And so it's almost like you want to be one step removed from the literal. So we'll have a, a take home assignment for this. Um, but it is like, okay, what is the personality of the business? Like, what is your role? What's your outcome? Okay, we want to be kind of this like knowledgeable guide that helps scientists get through. Okay, how do we share that visually? Um, again, it's not like a person with a staff, like let's go into folklore and cultural represent, representation of the ideas. If the idea is the quest for knowledge, let's think about an apple as a symbol of that. If the idea is that you are really drawn to like help guide scientists, let's think of the owl as a representation of that. And then we layer in additional information. Like I love the owl because I love wildlife. So it works two ways to say something important about why we do this work. The leaves were just a nod to, you know, conservation and the idea of restoration. So you can layer in small drivers of your why um, in, in really kind of simple ways. So, you know, I said a, a goal is to be almost one step removed from the literal and to avoid using cliche imagery, yeah, kind of dig a little bit into historical and cultural contexts of ideas. So instead of putting DNA in your logo, which we see a lot, um, how else can you talk about your interests in evolution and like your, the why behind your work for understanding change? Like what else can that look like if you don't stick a DNA symbol on there? Um, instead of a beaker, how can we capture those ideas of being fearless and experimental and innovative? Um, how can we break from the kind of cliche imagery and build something that's really unique? So I, I was almost going to try and do another activity today of having us kind of sketch out a logo, but I just want to give this um, to you to take home as another a fun way to think about your identity. So you don't have to actually draw it out. Don't necessarily draw a logo, but I think sometimes doing just the intellectual exercise of imagining what would be in it. So think about your why and think about like, how would I represent that visually? Because one thing that, you know, doing things visually forces you to do is think hierarchically. Like you can't put everything in there. So what is the most important thing to say about you and your work and what it's going to be like to work with you? Is it that you're fearless? Is it that you're innovative? Is it that you're interdisciplinary? Is it that you frame everything around every part of the process is designed for inclusivity and a really nice experience in science? Like, what is that most important thing? And then what are the representations of that beyond something really literal? Um, what does that mean for you? And I mean, these, these are things that like you can start to internalize in your life. You know, I can't even count how much owl shit I own now because it's part of the logo and it's become like 
such a part of my identity as a professional, that idea of like being full of knowledge and guiding like that, that becomes, I don't know, you just sort of internalize it and, and then it gives you this thing that you can represent and wear and have and put on the shelf. And sometimes I love just any way to take these abstract ideas and then turn them into like a real physical thing that you can hold. And the logo is kind of a fun way to do that. I mean, you can see it's on the door. And it was like, as soon as we put it on the door, it just felt so real. So these are just exercises to do for yourself. And you carry that representation of your identity with you. Um, I don't know, for me, it just feels so grounding and empowering. So I would encourage you to give some thought about kind of, you know, that idea of like, okay, if you were to attach it to like an animal or a species, or just think about like how to represent those things that matter the most to you. So the simpler version of that is color. So I wanted to talk a little bit about color psychology because this one is a little bit easier to apply because you can put it in your presentations. You can, um, you know, paint an office wall or something. When you also kind of understand a little bit about color psychology, then color can be an, another easy way to share parts of your identity without needing to be overt. So I just pulled this um, up on the internet. It seemed kind of simple enough and easy to read. So we're just going to read through this. So red is, um, and this is like the color psychology. So these are the feelings that you or other people kind of feel when you see these colors. So red gives you feelings of excitement and strength, love and energy. Um, orange gives you feelings of confidence, success, bravery. So stability, and some of this is a little frou-frou, I know, but yellow is this color that, you know, makes people feel creative and happy, warm and cheerful. I mean, you will see, like, we kind of yellow everywhere because once we started diving to sort of the color psychology, like, yes, yellow makes perfect sense for this business. We love to facilitate being in a creative space and being optimistic and warm and cheerful. But then our secondary color is uh, this teal that you see um, because it brings in some of that like suiting um, connection to nature. Um, green is healing, fresh and quality. Um, blue is a color that makes people think of trust and peace and competence. Pink is compassion, sincerity, sophistication, or sweet. Purple, royalty, luxury. Some of these are like historical, cultural um, connotations. Brown is, you know, organic, rugged. Uh, black, you can't go wrong with black. Formal, dramatic, sophisticated. White is uh, clean, simple, honest. Um, you know, it's just sort of, a nice way to think about like, all right, and an activity we have people do when we work with them in the branding space is write down three traits um, that describe the personality of your lab. So we can kind of extend that out. So this could be three traits that um, describe the personality of your science identity. So it's still okay to have some barrier between like, yes, I have a professional identity and it's not the same as like my mom mode. That's okay. There can still be a professional identity that brings some of that in, but lives as an identity of itself. So for my professional identity, yeah, yellow, teal, um, those colors are really meaningful for me. And again, it's kind of fun. So pick one color, I would say one or two and write those down as like, you can just kind of feel when something will strike you. And in this creative space, we talk a lot about like, okay, you're like an insect with an antennae. And so we're trying to encourage you to, to listen to just the things that pull at your heart a little bit. If you're reading this and something just resonates with you and gets your little antennae going, like connect to that. So let's say that's purple. All right, let's write that down. And purple becomes the new foundation for your logo, your website, your PowerPoint presentations, the figures in your publications. 
Um, you're going to paint a wall in your office or your lab purple, and you're going to get a pair of purple socks um, and wear them to work when you give presentations because like it's a color that says something about you. And um, as a total aside, it, like a person who wears purple socks to all of their talks just kind of becomes like a quirky human thing. So it is like all of these aspects just kind of make make the science space richer um, when you just give some thought to like, who am I and how do I reflect that? How do I embrace that? Um, I have very much embraced the yellow connection and yeah, now I just like love wearing yellow stuff because it's personally meaningful to me because I chose it um, to represent something about my identity. Um, okay, and, and we'll do questions at the end. So I guess I keep wanting to pause and ask for questions, but since I can't see the chat, I'm gonna just, should I just keep going? Or in the chat, can we all write down, just pick one color. Maybe I'll just stop sharing because I cannot see this chat. Um, can everybody write down the one color that, that kind of resonated with them? I can see the chat now, so. Blue, okay, nice, Katya. Yeah, blue has this like lovely soothing quality to it. Um, and I should say, I mean, these are obviously really big containers of feelings um, and a light blue will feel very different than a dark blue. Ooh, green and black, ooh, forest green. Ooh, orange and pink, hard to choose just one. That's true. Um, I, I think sometimes choosing two is even better because you can balance like the energy of yellow with the soothing quality of teal. Um, you know, pairing yellow and orange together as your colors is definitely like, holy smokes, okay, there's a lot of energy there. Um, so it's good to think about like, okay, how do we share our softer side or sh share other parts? Um, orange, yellow, and blue. Oh, I love that. Um, orange, purple. Oh, wonderful. Yeah, there is um, so much to play with in terms of color. And this one is really easy to apply because you really can't start to just use that color everywhere. Anytime you choose your specific purple, you'll feel like, yes, that's it. Um, all right, so we have a little bit of time left and I just wanted to take a few moments and showcase some projects that are personally meaningful to, to me, um, clients that we've worked with and I feel like kind of bring it all together. Um, a few websites that, that try and say a lot about who a person is and combine everything we've talked about from like compelling language to strategic use of color. Um, to illustration and graphic work. So let's see, I'm going to, I'm officially done with my slides. How do I stop sharing? Okay, cool. I'm gonna pull up just three websites, um, starting with my favorite. I even unplug the monitor. Let's see, did I lose everyone? Um, I lost myself. All right, here we are. Okay, so I'm going to just pull up three. Um, and this is one of my favorite websites to start. So this uh, scientist is named Shane Campbell Staten. He is the first scientist of color that's ever been hired in Princeton's Ecology and Evolutionary Biology Department. Um, and he has this commitment to um, bringing science to underrepresented groups, but really just like making science have this super accessible feel to it. And he works a lot in mass media. A lot of these clips are from um, shows he's worked on and, and interviews he's done. So we started with the design of this logo. And yes, it is DNA. Um, which we tried to explore other ideas for, but, you know, 
it's okay in the end too to lean on something that you feel like if this is the representation that really speaks to your heart and captures everything you want to say about he, he works on evolution in the Anthropocene um, then how do we make it feel really unique to you so Shane is a beatboxer and um, it really identifies with hip-hop culture and graffiti culture and um, so we tried to bring this kind of raw um, feeling to the design and then we designed these color palettes um, a lot of purple kind of I would say the vibe for this site is Afrofuturist. So it was really inspired by things like Black Panther, um, that kind of really gorgeous, um, like clean, modern, um, but embracing like Black excellence and the like African cultural roots. And so we drew from patterns in um, some of the South, South African um, textures and textiles so yeah we kind of did this um like repeating patterns and just textures that were personally meaningful for Shane um in the spaces that he works and then of course uh, thoughtful use of like okay it, it needs to feel vibrant and fresh so we brought in a light teal but it needs to feel like honest and kind of royal so we brought in the purple and Shane's site, we designed to really have this, we always put in news for people, but to kind of flow like a story. So to take you through and use really accessible language and understanding a new chapter in the story of evolution dominated by the pressures of human history, movement, culture, politics, and conflict. Um, so yeah, we just played a lot with textures and color and kind of cool, slightly more technological aspects. Um, we did this whole illustration series for each of his projects um, that, that kind of reflects that graffiti style uh, to, again, just try and attract like a new, new types of people to science. Like, yeah, let's get people who are super into graffiti and like street art. And um, so, yeah, this was just a really fun site to work on that. I think when we were done, just really felt like, you know, a, a website that says something about who you are and what you value and where you're from. Um, in contrast to that, here's a totally different vibe. Uh, so this is Carrie Havrila. She's from um, the uh, CSU here in Colorado. And she had a totally different inspiration. So she is, um, you know, really drawn to these desert paths of these landscapes that she works in and these landscapes that she loves so much. So when we designed the logo, we were trying really hard to capture that sense of stewardship and love for the space. Um, hope that comes through. And again, there are small touches. She works in soil. Um, microbial system so she you know a little bit of soil microbe but generally the big thing that we were hoping to convey is just this like love for natural landscapes and these desert spaces and dry land ecosystems which so many people think are like dead and barren but they're actually really rich in life it's just life like grasses and stuff so the color palette's really different um, the imagery all kind of has this like layer of I don't know, vintage pastel-y colors. Um, we tried to play with textures that reflect, yeah, a little bit of her why and how, like this is part of a nod to the microbial systems and soil. Um, so just a, a totally different vibe. And for her, you know, the goal was to just show she, she as a person is really like soothing, comforting, warm, easy to work with, not a high energy electric vibe. Um, so it's, you know, we kind of find all the ways we can to, to reflect that in colors and um, design. And then the last one I want to show you. So Saad, um, the Bomla Lab, the, um, let's see, you don't want to see it from the back end. Um, the um, logo that I showed you that had a million and one things in it. Um, so we did his website. 
and, and brand. And essentially we decided to um, kind of focus on almost like early 19th century curiosity cabinets, because that is basically the way his science works. Like he just chases like, yeah, okay. I work on insect pee and tomorrow I'm going to invent a hearing aid and the day after that I'm going to do the physics of a worm blob so like we spent so much time trying to figure out like okay what are the threads that connect this like what is your why um and his whole why is really about um curiosity for the world like yeah you think that thing is weird go study it and so, yeah, we did these kind of weird collages and um, it's definitely quirky. And all throughout the site, we try and reiterate this, like his science is entirely powered by curiosity. It's just whatever excites him that day. It's okay to have a mashup of trapdoor spiders and like how do glasses work and all of that stuff. So collages were the visual tool um, that we felt like sort of made this like kind of uh, this concept that was really hard to connect feel a little bit, bit more peaceful. So, yeah, I mean, he, he invented an electro pin. Andy studies spiders. Andy studies worm blobs. And so, like, how do you build a cohesive identity that makes all of that feel like the most natural thing in the world? So we just had this, like, super playful, like, kind of discovery, curiosity-driven language um, and just really quirky um, really quirky graphics and stuff that, that try and capture a little bit of, of what it's like to work with him. So um, I can go on and on about websites, but it's probably time to answer questions. Are you getting, is that about right for timing, Alexa? Yeah, we have about five minutes left. And if there are any uh, questions from the audience, you can unmute yourself or uh, write them in the chat. And feel free to just chime in and unmute yourself. Um, oh, you know what I didn't share actually was just the final slide with my contact information. I'll put that up as... Um, as the final um, takeaway is you can always reach out to me at any time. I, I see a comment in the chat from Meg oh. about the websites. And, and I think the websites that you've shown really exemplify how this all comes together, how we can bring our, our why into our bios and not just our bios and let that transcend into all that we do. Some of us may be in different stages of our careers in terms of, you know, where we're at in terms of science communication, but uh, the key messages that you've provided certainly hold true and that we can all apply into our work. Yeah, and thanks so much for chiming in. Uh, I love the websites. That it's really yeah, fun. Um, so let's see, so I do have, basically, you can find me on social at Impact Media Lab across platforms. Um, or just go to impactmedialab.com and I have this little like chat button at the bottom and you can just jump on my calendar. Um, and again, I'm happy to look over bios. I'm happy to talk about websites. I'm happy to you know, sketch your logo and send it to me. I would totally love to, to see like, oh yeah, this is what I'm feeling. This is what I'm getting. Is that right? How else could you maybe talk about your connection to um, land stewardship or something? So uh, please don't be a stranger. I'm I'm super pumped to talk about it at any time. Thanks so much for that awesome presentation, Kika. I'm curious, uh, how much do these websites cost and logos and things like that? Because typically graphic design services cost like in the thousands of dollars for a simple logo. And I mean, a, web, a website like these with all the custom artwork, that's gotta be expensive. So like, I mean, how much of your team's time does it take to put some, something like this together? Yeah, oh, that's a good question. Well, if, if anybody would like to know, our website package is $6,900. And that that's includes, pretty cheap. Yeah, thank you. We try and keep it affordable. And that includes everything, logo, branding, communication strategy, the design of the website, 
And um, so we try really hard to, to, be, to make it open for everybody. But, that's with, the goal. but you have to be doing quite a few in the course of a year in order to make that go around with all those people employed. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> We do a lot of websites. Um, well, and occasionally we do, you know, like films, you know, films um, carry some of the weight. We try and keep the website packages the more affordable option for everybody. That may Very be cool. more nuanced than you want to know, but. No, that, they can, because I'm thinking about lab budgets and thinking about like how money is often a scarce resource for most um for many in science and so I'm, I'm curious how you make a business of this when people are want or not wanting to part with much money yeah so. um I, well we've we've been able to like you know people have startups people have grants we do a lot of grant funded websites we just call it you know the it's sort of the communication foundation for the project so if you ever need language to justify it to funders i have like a whole toolkit <laughs> Um, but yeah, all this information's on our website. We have the pricing and the packages and all that stuff available for anyone who's interested. That's a really good point, Keegan, and how to incorporate communication into your funding applications. I think a lot of the time for, for scientists um, and projects in general, that communications piece is almost folded in after the fact. Um, um, so I'm, I'm glad to hear that you that you mentioned that. I'm curious, how many scientists come to you um, looking for websites? What are, is it, is websites the most common uh, request or are there common themes in terms of improving science communication that you've seen? Yeah, um, well, I, when I started the business, I thought we were gonna do mostly documentary film. Um, I was kind of, exp I thought sort of science communication was like all the way up here and everybody was ready for a film and we've all just been waiting. And um, so we made our first film and then it came time to putting it somewhere. And it was like, oh, okay, well, let's put it on your website. Like, I don't have a website. Well, let's put it on social media. I don't, I don't have social media, I'm not on social media. Um, and so I would say the business completely pivoted at that point and said like, okay, well, I would love to work every scientist up to where we're doing a really powerful documentary about your work, but first we need to do this really foundational thinking about who are you, what's your identity, what are your messages, we need a website first, so that any media that comes afterwards has a natural home where it lives, and so yeah, I, I um, you know, I would say all of our clients are kind of on this like five to 10 year plan. We're going to get to films eventually, but first we need to do this really foundational brand work. And um, a lot of our clients do not uh, feel comfortable with the term brand, but, you know, just the idea that we need to do really good thinking about what, what are your goals? Why are you here? Because those are the threads that are really compelling to people. And so those, um, it's just really good to think through those those stories and um, how you're going to kind of talk about it first. So, mm -hmm. yeah, so that's how we got into websites and that and brand design and stuff to begin with. Yeah, that holistic approach. You can't focus just on the outputs. It has to be, you know, start to finish. Yeah. Well, and building an audience, you know, I mean, I think we all hope like, okay, you make this great thing and it's going to go super viral. And that's what we're going to report to funders as like major impact for the work. But, um, you know, we've, we've kind of learned that virality isn't really an accident. It's this thing that happens after you cultivate an audience um, for many years. And so we have to start people on the journey of like, okay, you have to cultivate an audience. And to cultivate an audience, you have to share more than just the papers, you know, you, um, because again, that's not what people are going to connect with. So we're trying to think through like, all right, what are, what's your community going to rally around? What are people going to be major fans of you for? Um, science is part of that, but connecting with you as a person is a, such an important ingredient in building community. So. Absolutely. 
Well, thank you so much, Kika, for such a compelling session today. You've certainly flipped the script for me, and I hope that our participants uh, have felt the same way. Uh, I've certainly learned a lot. Thank you to all of our participants who were brave to share their revamped bios. Uh, we encourage you to reach out to Kika and the other participants as well if there was something that uh, struck a chord and you'd like to connect with. And that is a wrap on our session.